Okay, so let's get on with the lecture. Um, acute visual disturbance, as I say, and today uh, I'll give an overview at the start of what I'm talking about and then an approach to the history and exam of this group of conditions. And then we'll go through the cases or the conditions one by one in the second half of the talk. The overview is that we're focusing on optic neuropathies today. So these are a cause of visual disturbance, which um, I would say are not common, but they are serious when they happen. Uh, they're not rare either. So in an eye clinic, we'll see these every week, probably, I would say. Um, one or two cases. And you'll also see them in emergency and you'll see them as GPs. <coughs> so what is an optic neuropathy? This is what we're talking about today. It's any abnormality or damage to the optic nerves from any cause. And today we'll talk about some of the more common ones. I'm gonna be showing you lots of pictures today. What I want you to appreciate is a normal optic nerve and an abnormal optic nerve to start with. We've talked about that approach in some of the previous lectures. Just know what normal is so you can quickly identify what's abnormal. And then you can start to describe the abnormal one in some basic detail. So in this picture, we've got a slide, uh, an image called A and an image called B, starting with this gentleman over here in the blue shirt. Do you want to tell me which one's normal, A or B? Uh, B. And is B the right eye or the left eye? Uh, that is the left eye. How uh, can you tell? Because uh, it Optic nerve is nasal. Good. All right. So then what does that make A? Oh, that would be the right eye. That would be the right eye. And what's the abnormal the abnormal thing about the right eye? Moving on to the next gentleman uh, now. No. Yeah. Uh, what's the obvious abnormality? The optic disc. Maybe yeah. you can even call it a disc. Say that again. What about it? Uh, the, the optic disc is? Uh, no, no, no. Not normal. Good. Next person. Maybe that's the latest why. Yeah. Substance and it also looks like some hemorrhage or something. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So the disc is indistinct. You can't really make it out. Um, and there's white material there, and there's red material there. Red material is blood. So that disc is swollen. This is what really bad disc swelling looks like for optic disc edema. So this person's got right-sided unilateral severe optic disc edema. That's what you'd say, right? And then many things can cause that. So what are the symptoms that these guys present with? Well, visual blurring, obviously, or, or visual loss. In the early stages, though, a lot of optic neuropathies just present with a change in color vision. So it can be quite subtle. All the symptoms can be really vague and, and indistinct. But in general terms, blurred vision, loss of vision, or a change in color vision. And as I mentioned earlier, it's uncommon but not rare. And early diagnosis does affect visual outcomes, morbidity, and even mortality in some cases. And we'll talk about those a bit later on. So here is a complicated looking table, but I'll, I'll break it down for you. This is the approach to optic disc elevation. So I'm talking, we're talking about disc edema or disc elevation, which we break down into true optic nerve head swelling, INH, optic nerve head swelling, or what we call pseudopapal edema, where you have an anatomical uh, configuration of the optic nerve head, which looks as if it's swollen, but isn't really swollen. For your purposes, everything is true optic nerve head swelling. Okay, this distinction is really one for an ophthalmologist to make. So if you think the optic nerve head looks elevated, raised, swollen, then eventually they need to end up in front of us. Um, so let's focus on optic nerve head swelling. Well, what you break it down into further is either the intracranial pressure is elevated or not, okay? And so an elevated intracranial pressure, you get what we call papal edema which is bilateral optic disc swelling, optic nerve head swelling from elevated intracranial pressure. That's what papal edema is. So it needs to be bilateral for you to call it papal edema. And uh, if you see papal edema, then you think raised intracranial pressure. 
Optic nerve head swelling with normal intracranial pressure usually is unilateral. There are various causes. It's sort of a surgical suit, and we'll go through some of those today. So just think normal ICP tends to more commonly be unilateral. Elevated ICP tends to more commonly be bilateral, and I'll, I'll explain why soon enough. Uh, so let's begin by talking about papilledema. But later on, we'll go through these other conditions and end with some that I just want you to be aware of. History-wise, what do we want to know? Well, the symptoms are variable. I mentioned that. Uh, you get variable visual change. You can definitely get pain, especially with optic neuritis. So optic neuritis is a cause of pain, either retrovulvar or periocular, often with eye movements. Okay, so pain on eye movements is a clue that you've got an optic nerve problem. If the person's got, say, demyelination, okay, multiple sclerosis, causing optic neuritis, then they may have systemic symptoms as well. I'll make sure you ask about systemic symptoms, paresthesia, weakness, that sort of thing. And I think I mentioned this in the last lecture, always in your ophthalmology, OSCEs, and in real life, don't forget to ask about systemic symptoms. Don't just get fixated on, on the eyeball. Uh, TVOs are transient visual obscurations, okay? Transient visual obscurations means that transiently the person loses vision or vision goes blurry. That's not uncommon in optic neuropathies. And, it, and, it, and if you see that, then you think of raised intracranial pressure, okay? Uh, the other one's definitely headache, especially a postural headache, it's patients bending down to pick something up. Um, and the headache's gonna be bad enough to induce vomiting uh, if they're really bad. And diplopia is another one. And the diplopia often is transient too. It's not necessarily uh, stable diplopia. So there's some of the symptoms. Uh, this is probably the most important differentiator, I would say, to come up with diagnoses or, or, or differential diagnosis, and that's the person's age. So younger patients more often tend to get optic neuritis. If it's going to be an optic neuropathy, your younger patients are more often present with optic neuritis. Your middle-aged patient will more often present with, this one's got a long name, non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. Okay. That tends to be a disease of middle age, non-arteritic, so it's not inflammatory. Ischemic, you know what that means, optic neuropathy, you know what that means. So uh, this is caused by arteriosclerosis and it tends to happen in vascular paths. Okay. So middle aged high BMI, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, that tends to be your NAION pattern, as opposed to your elderly patient, where you need to think about GCA, giantal arteritis, also known as temporal arteritis, also known as arthritic ischemic optic neuropathy. So giantal arteritis is inflammatory. Okay? It's an arteritis of middle and large uh, diameter blood vessels or arteries. That's what GCA is. So younger patients optic neuritis, middle-aged people NAION, older patients say 60 to 70 plus AION, arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. That's a sort of a uh, rule of thumb to steer you in the right direction. Uh, onset wise, the, the onset's also important as well in history, okay? So NAION and GCA tend to present acutely. So we're talking minutes to hours. Uh, trauma should be obvious in history. A person's been in a car accident, person fell over, person was assaulted. So you should, you know, that, that should be quite obvious in how it presents. But if you've otherwise got a fairly fast progression, then think NAI or GCO. If it's subacute, more like hours to days, that fits more with your optic neuritis patient who is going to be younger. So you see a 25 year old with visual change over days, you want to be thinking optic neuritis. And then your more gradual stuff tends to be either toxic nutritional, so lack of B12, lack of folate, too much alcohol, we'll touch on those at the end, uh, or a tumor which is compressing the optic nerves. So they don't tend to develop other hours or days. They can take months to use. So that's some of the history that you want to be aware of. We 
emphasis on age. What about examination? Well, we talked about normal and abnormal. This is actually a case of papilledema where it's more pronounced in the right eye, but the left optic disc margin is actually slightly blurred. It's not super sharp and crisp like we saw with that very first image. If I take you back there, what I want you to really appreciate here in the, in the left eye is that the margin between yellow nerve and orange or darkish retinal tissue around the nerve is very, very clear and distinct. You can clearly see a round yellow circle on an orangish or dark orange or reddish sort of background. Anytime that's lost, you're wondering about swelling or the nerve. So let's go back to this one. Yes, I can see that there's uh, some yellow tissue there, but the margin isn't quite as clear and distinct as it So anytime, and, and in this one, it's more pronounced. Here it's more pronounced, can you agree? That fuzziness is more pronounced. So if you see fuzziness on one side, which clearly looks like it's a dentist, look at the other side. It just seems there's a hint of swelling or loss of uh, clarity there as well of the margin. Everyone happy with that? But the left one slightly abnormal too. The reason I'm saying that is papilledema can definitely be asymmetric. So you get one that's more swollen, one that's less swollen, but you're still concerned about papilledema. That's important because you worry about raised ICP. That's important because you worry about a brain tumor, which is a threat to life. So this is why papilledema in particular is so important because it can be a threat to life. Um, look, and, and we'll touch more on papilledema in a moment, but examination-wise, it's nothing that we haven't done or covered already in the skills workshop and the other lectures. It's the normal approach to optic nerve exam. So your afro -C, um, sort of acronym. Uh, we've got the thymoscopy video online. And the other thing, good thing that's, that you need to know or be able to sketch out at least, is your visual pathway. So we might show you a visual field defect and say, where in the visual pathway do you think will be affected? I'm not gonna go through it now, but you wanna be able to draw that out quickly in front of you in a clinical situation or an exam, or an exam situation. You don't need to memorize it necessarily, it's good if you do, but um, you should be able to sketch it down and work out where a lesion is or what a certain lesion, what kind of visual field defect it will produce. Okay, everyone happy with examination? Yeah. So let's move on to some of the cases or, or the conditions that we talked about. Okay, so moving on to this lady here with a light blue jumper. You want to tell me what's normal and abnormal, this person? We're focusing on, on optic discs, but you can comment on the rest of the fungus as well if you want. Okay, so um, on the image on the right, mm -hmm. um, the optic disc looks a and swollen. You can't see the border. Image on your right? On, yeah, on yeah. my right. Yeah, which eye is that? Um, so the left eye. Okay. Um, on the, so the image on the left, um, the optic disc, um, I would say that's also abnormal. Okay. Um, because it's not as clear as we saw in the previous picture. <laughs> Yeah, I agree it's not as clear as the first picture, but that actually is normal. Oh, is I mean, it? Fair enough, you haven't seen heaps of optic nerve pictures, but yeah. um, the left one's clearly the more abnormal one. Anything else about these images that is not perfectly normal? Yes. Is, is there like new new blood vessels forming? Whereabouts? Just a, around the Um Which eye and, and whereabouts? There's a bit of just new blood vessels forming bilaterally. You can see smaller blood vessels. I'm not sure. Do you mean at the disc? At the yeah, at the disc. So. Yeah. Hmm. Look, that's a good thought because new blood vessels do tend to be very fine and frilly. Yeah. But they tend to happen more in diabetics. Okay. Right? So neovascularization at the disc is a concern in diabetic people. Hmm. Um, so if I told you that this person was diabetic, that's something to, to think about. These blood vessels are actually normal. Oh. And neovascularization in diabetes tends to be isolated to one area. Whereas these sort of finer vessels, you can see they're present circumferentially throughout most of the disc. That's a bit of a fine point. But your biggest clue is, you know, if, if this was a, an OSCE, this person would not have been diabetic. Right? 
Um, shall we move to the next person? Anything else abnormal in this image? We've got a swollen left optic disc. We've said that the right optic disc is normal. So remember in one of our earlier lectures, we said, when you look at the back of the eye, you've got a pale optic disc, you've got red blood vessels, you've got intervening orangey retinal tissue, everything else is abnormal, right? So based on that, yes, we've, got, we've talked about the optic disc, so you can see the red blood vessels. Do you have anything other than orange retinal tissue? That's a yes or no answer. Yes. Okay. Where is it? Um. Let's see, let me turn these front lights down that I can't quite figure out how. Yeah, where is it and what? I think it's there. It's over here? Yeah. Okay. I don't know which one. Someone want to help her out? Next person, the white t shirt. Is it the yellow spots in the middle of um, both eyes? Yeah, what are they called? Um, I was going to say Drusen, but I don't think it's. You, you should have said Drusen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I said Drusen. Good. So what part of the eye are they in? The, um, the retina? Yes, the retina, but what part of the retina? The macula. Macula, yeah. yeah. So they're drizzling in the macula. Next person, what does that tell you about the age of this person? Um, like older. Good. Therefore, what diagnosis are you worried about? Yes, but this is an optic neuropathy talk. <laughs> yeah, great. So it's as simple as that. Okay, the approach to ophthalmology, as far as you guys are concerned, can be as simple as that. Oh, I've got unilateral disc swelling. I can see Drizzen, an older person. I'm worried about this. Okay. And, you know, in an OSCE, we don't just show you this picture. We give you all, we give you the person's age and we give you the symptoms and so on. But that's how, that's the, formulation if you like of a case so gca talking about it first because it's one of the most ser more serious conditions and as you can see what it results in is narrowing of the lumen leading to ischemia uh, which ends up affecting the ophthalmic artery and you get ischemia of the optic nerve head um, so this is a systemic vasculitis of medium and large arteries. Older patients over 60 years old, the classic symptoms are uh, jaw claudication. So patients don't say, I've got jaw claudication. They might say, I've had discomfort when I'm chewing food, but you want to ask them. So if you have discomfort when you're chewing food, they won't tell you they've got scalp tenderness. You say, has it been uncomfortable recently when you brush your hair or wash your hair? Um, they can get pain going down their neck as well. So any new neck pain, everyone's got some arthritis, but any pain in the neck or shoulder that's new for you. And transient visual obscurations we talked about earlier and deployed there as well. They can get systemic symptoms as well. So fatigue, weight loss, this sort of thing. Uh, NAION doesn't give you those systemic symptoms. Uh, Arteritic ischemic optimopathy or GCA, these will tend to be unwell, okay? So myalgia, weight loss, this sort of thing. The disc swelling we describe as being chalky white rather than yellow. For your purposes, don't worry too much about that. Just focus on age. You can get cotton wool spots as well. So don't be surprised if you've got a swollen disc in an older person with some surrounding cotton wool spots. They're infarcts of the inner retina. So the whole area is ischemic. And you can actually fully occlude the artery as well. So you can get giant cell arthritis plus uh, central retinal artery occlusion. And that's where the whole retina looks pale. You guys will have seen images of that. Whole retina looks pale and there's a little red spot in the middle, cherry red spot. Looks very different to the other eye. So that's dual pathology, which you can get. You then need to palpate the temporal artery. That needs to be part of your examination. And so a temporal artery, the temporal artery will be tender and you won't feel a pulse in the same way that you'll feel it in the normal uh, temporal artery. You can all palpate your own temporal artery. I'm palpating mine right now. There it is. It's pulsatile. It's not tender. It should be fairly symmetric. Okay. 
what's our management or your management? Immediately, if you're worried about GCA, do a full blood count ESR and CRP. Full blood count looking for raised platelets, ESR and CRP looking for elevation. Okay, particularly CRP is sensitive to GCA. And if you're concerned about GCA, then have a discussion with ophthalmologist if you can, but whether you can get through to one of us or not, start high dose steroids unless they're definitely contraindicated, which they can be sometimes. Um, because time is, this is a time critical um, condition and if it's not treated, they'll lose vision guaranteed virtually and they'll then lose it um, contralaterally within hours to days. That's why GCA is so serious. Confirmation of the diagnosis comes with a temporal artery biopsy. So sometimes we do that, sometimes vascular surgeons will do that, sometimes general surgeons will do that, just depends who's available. But that's required within seven days of starting steroids. It tends to model the results if it's after seven days. Prognosis, as, as I said, untreated, a third will become contralateral within weeks and can involve the aorta as well. So that's why it can be a threat to life. So threat to sight, threat to life, older patient, systemic symptoms, unilateral visual loss. Think of GCA, start steroids, do blood tests, and urgent ophthalmology referral. All right, moving on to the next um, condition. So I think we're up to the gentleman in the greenish jumper. Or have we already done you? Done, okay. <laughs> next guy, Boston. Um, what have we got here? What's the obvious abnormality? Good. Good, yep. And anything else that's abnormal, you've passed, but for extra points. Um, with whitish tissue around here. These, this is just artifact. I mean, it's see how symmetric it is when you see yeah. things that are really similar. That's artifact on reflection. But um, look, you've got some hemorrhage here, hard to tell here and here, it's pretty subtle. And the other thing is the veins look uh, tortuous and bigger than normal veins. So venous tortuosity, that's, that's, a, that's a feature of, you know, you've got a swollen disc. Venus return gets impaired because of raised hydrostatic pressure. And so the veins look really um, accentuated, uh, or we, call, we say that they're tortuous. So, okay, we've got bilateral disc swelling, which we've said is papilledema until proven otherwise. This is a brain tumor until proven otherwise. Okay, that's what I want you to take away from today. So papilledema, let's talk about that. Here's a schematic picture which shows a normal disc and then a swollen disc due to fluid at CSF in the subarachnoid space exerting mechanical pressure on the optic disc, causing it to swell. So it's bilateral due to raised ICP. We've said that, we've talked about some of the symptoms. Pulsatile tinnitus is the other one. Has anyone heard of that before in a PNT or neurology term? That just means you can hear your own heartbeat. And papilledema patients will sometimes tell you, yeah, I can hear a whooshing sound. Um, sometimes, not necessarily all the time. Differentials, uh, well, most of these end up being idiopathic, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, okay? But that is the last diagnosis you go to. That's a diagnosis of exclusion. The first one you go to is a tumor. Is this a tumor? And actually before even that, Malignant hypertension can cause this. So the first test you do is bedside blood pressure. Is this just due to malignant hypertension? Yeah, infection, they should have other signs and symptoms. Venous signs, thrombosis, you're going to tell that from neuroimaging. Okay. So the order goes uh, blood pressure by the bedside, then neuroimaging, if that's normal, neuroimaging of some sort. And CT is usually the quickest to get, but the definitive one to rule out a venous sinus thrombosis is an MRV, MRI, MRV, okay, where we're looking at the, so venogram, okay, where we're looking at the venous sinuses. Uh, okay. 
Um, so for, yeah, full neurological exam, you're looking for other neuropathies, MR or CT. So once we've excluded a space occupying lesion, the definitive test for idiopathic intracranial hypertension then, so raised ICP, is a lumbar puncture. And we look at the opening pressure when we do the LP. Well, I say we, but it's the neurologists who we do that. So let's talk about IIH. IIH is one cause of papilledema. In the community, it's the commonest cause, but as I say, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Okay, you don't go straight to IIH, but there are clues. Uh, we don't quite know what the identifiable cause for IIH is, but we know the risk factors, and they are female gender of a childbearing age with a high BMI plus or minus oral contraceptive, oral contraceptive pill. So that's your, they're your cues in real life, they're your cues in the hospital. Young female, high BMI, childbearing age with variable visual symptoms, you need to be thinking IIH, but rule out hypertension and other causes first. So management, as I've said, MRI, MRV, if, if you exclude nasty intracranial things, then they get an LP. And the treatment is medical, most commonly medical. The most effective thing is weight loss, which unfortunately is also the hardest thing. Um, there are medications that are used for IIH that reduce the production of CSF. So particularly acetazolamide, topiramate is often used as well. And if that doesn't work, then there are surgical procedures to fenestrate the optic nerve to let fluid out, let pressure out. And there's neurosurgical stent procedures as well to redirect um, intracranial fluid elsewhere. Bariatric surgery is also more and more common these days for people who want to reduce their BMI, so that's not uncommon. Prognosis with IH is very variable. It can cause blindness. It can cause a permanent scotoma due to optic nerve, ongoing optic nerve damage. It really depends on the management of the BMI, the ICP, compliance with medication, whether they have surgery or not. Most people do okay, but it can definitely be a cause of ongoing symptoms and it's common. So you need to know about it. How's everyone going? Overwhelmed? No? A couple of shakes of the head? That's good. All right. Um, Gentleman in the white shirt there. Tell me the abnormality in the fundus photo. Normal or abnormal? Yeah. What's the abnormal bit? Superior or, or inferior? Sorry? Is it superior or inferior? Uh, inferior. Uh -huh. um, Agree. And what is it that's abnormal, just in plain language? The difference between superior and inferior is what? The purple Yeah, this stuff? No, it's not, it's not a new vascular. Um, Again, if the person has diabetes, reasonable thought. The, the basic difference I would say is if you focus on the contour, you can't see a yellow versus orange contour there. Do you agree? Whereas down, whereas down here, it's lost. Oh. Yeah, you don't see it as clearly. And yeah, this is blood. So you've got edema here of a sector of the optic nerve. So when you get disc edema, the whole thing doesn't have to be swollen. You get part of it that's swollen. So this person's got sectoral optic nerve edema, inferior sectoral optic nerve edema, okay? Uh, next person, does that fit with the visual field test that you see on the right? I'm going to tell you that they've lost superior field here. That's what this, these black areas mean on a visual field test when we do one. So does the clinical picture fit with the test result? Yes or no? 
50-50. Let's go back a step. So when you've got structures at the back of the eye, do they serve the same part of the visual field or the opposite part of the visual field? So what I mean is you've got inf structures at the bottom of the eye, inferior retina or bottom half of the optic disc. Is that looking at the bottom part of the world or the top part of the world? I'm not sure. It's inverted, yeah. So if you've got the bottom of the disc being affected, that serves the top part of the world, right? Yeah. So then does this fit? Yes. Yeah, it does. So that's the visual field test for that condition, right? This could easily be real life or, I mean, in real life, you do a confrontation build test and very valuable to help in your, your diagnosis. So this is what NAION can often look like. It often can be sectoral. It doesn't have to involve the whole disc. It can involve the whole disc. All of these can cause visual field defects. I'm, I didn't show you that because it's special for NAION. Uh, but NAION does tend to be more sectoral. If you have a look at this image here, this probably started superiorly, where you've got the hemorrhage up here, but the bottom part of the of the disc is now affected as well. Uh, field defect here is, is more inferior, with the top part of the disc being more severely affected. Okay, so it's the opposite of what we just saw in the other picture. So the etiology here is thought to be a combination of an, an anatomical crowded disc, so you've got a small disc and the vessels are crowded together. Then you get arteriosclerosis. Over time, arteries become sclerosed. And in one area, you get ischemia. That's what NAION is at the head of the optic nerve. Presentation, as I said earlier, middle-aged people, over 50-ish, okay? Uh, with vascular risk factors. Another one is sleep apnea. That's a risk factor for NAI when, um, and often they notice their symptoms when they wake. And that's thought to be because of nocturnal hypotension. So blood pressure goes down overnight. More commonly sectoral disc swelling, as we've mentioned. Altitudinal field loss means that top or bottom part of the visual field going missing, as you've seen there. So the management here is systemic. You can't reverse an NAI when, it's different to GCA, you treat GCA with steroids, and you can actually improve their vision very quickly. NAI when you don't get that, the treatment isn't steroids. You want to prevent them getting another NAI when. And you can avoid blood pressure medications in the evening. That's one thing that can reduce people's risk because that's more likely to drop their blood pressure overnight, leading to inadequate arterial perfusion of the optic nerve head, which causes the yeah, NAI. Prognosis-wise, often they remain static. They can improve slightly. And about one in eight or thereabouts, one in seven, one in eight people will also get it in the other eye. So um, good systemic control of risk factors is important here. You want to control blood pressure, but not drop it down into their boots overnight. That's the... That's the sort of balancing act with NAI. Okay, let's move on. So I've got lady up the back there with the glasses. Which eye is that normal, right or left? Uh huh. And why? Good. And give me one more abnormality. Um, the Macular well, like isn't okay. If you focus at, on the disc, uh, I agree with you, the margin is not distinct. That's some blood there. And this is some blood here. Maybe you need to see a lot of images before that sort of thing jumps out. But to me, those, look, those two spots look different to your normal blood vessels. This kind of doesn't go anywhere, and this is just thicker than it should be. Yeah? So unilateral disc swelling. This person's 23. What condition are you thinking of? Next person along. 
Good. All right, it's getting through. Excellent. So let's talk about osteoarthritis. Here we go. Here's an MRI showing you an enhanced right optic nerve compared to the left optic nerve. It looks thicker, wider. Um, radiologically, it's more, more enhanced. It's a, it's a lighter color and it fits with the right side of optic neuritis that we just saw. So optic neuritis is immune mediated and you may or may not have demyelination. So demyelination being a risk factor for multiple sclerosis. Uh, as I said, presentation is younger. With the idiopathic ones, often there's a preceding viral illness. A young person viral illness, then you natural visual loss. They may or may not get neurological symptoms depending on whether there's systemic involvement. And some of them already have MS. So you want to ask that in your history. In your, in your do, you, do you know if you've got MS? Have you ever been diagnosed with that? Most commonly it's idiopathic, so that's why that's up the top. Uh, this is the one where they need serial MRIs looking for demyelination. Infective and inflammatory look less common, definitely in EDs and, and GPs, but you just want to be aware that they're possible. And often they'll have systemic symptoms if they've got an infective cause particularly. So these guys need an MRI looking for those T2 hyperintense lesions, often around the ventricles and uh, screening bloods to rule out uh, infection, possibly LP, if we're still worried about uh, infection after imaging. Um, treatment is high dose steroids here. Although most cases of idiopathic optic neuritis, the vision will return to normal or near normal on its own. Steroids just speed up that recovery and they're possibly a little bit better for final color vision. So optic neuritis is one where you do think steroids um, for speed of recovery, not necessarily for final visual outcome. If they've got okay vision in the other eye, then it can just be all right to observe them. Okay. Um, if it's known MS, then interferon uh, treatment these days definitely reduces progression. So that's a neurology co-management situation. So these guys will be managed between us, neurology, that's probably about it actually. If it's an autoimmune condition, uh, then possibly rheumatology. Uh, the most common scenario is idiopathic, as I said. Um, and most will return to near normal VA, as I mentioned. If the MRI is positive, they've got over a 50% risk of developing MS over a 10 year period. So let's say you've got a single hyper intense lesion around the ventricles, they need serial MRI imaging over time. And in most people, if once that you've got an abnormal MRI, you're more likely than not to develop MS. So if you're seeing that person as a GP or uh, in ED, there's no reason you can't go ahead with arranging an MRI once you've had a discussion with one of us. And if you can't get a scan for some reason, then get them to a neurologist or an ophthalmologist sooner rather than later. Okay. Starting to get towards the end now. These are some of the last few conditions which. I just want you to be aware of, you don't need to know about these in detail. You just need to know that there are other causes of optic neuropathy, apart from the more common ones that we've talked about. Uh, all these slides will be on LMS, guys, so if you don't get them now, don't worry. With a, an MRI like this, we just want you to spot the obvious abnormality. Okay, So there's a big fat tumor there in the intracranial space in the forebrain. Okay? which is going to affect which part of the visual field, do you think? Here's the right optic nerve. And uh, if you follow this back, the optic chiasm is going to be here somewhere. 
Is it going to affect right side of visual field only? Or will it affect both visual fields? The gentleman in the dark t shirt? Yeah. Is it just the right side? It's predominantly right sided, but this part of it here tells me that it's going to include the optic chiasm or will affect the optic chiasm. So it'll be predominantly right, but some, it'll be bilateral, essentially, is what I'm saying. Yeah. If it's, if it's at or close to the chiasm, it's going to be bilateral. Okay, so tumors tend to be gradual and progressive. The most common one is meningioma. There are others, pituitary tumors, quite common adenomas or microadenomas. Thyroid eye disease, actually, not a tumor, but it's a relatively, well, uncommon but not rare cause of optic So you've got really bad thyroid eye disease. The extraocular muscles within the eye socket swell up very, very badly. And if it's bad enough, they can compress the optic nerve and cause loss of vision. That's why thyroid eye disease is a, is a problem, because it can cause blocks into one of the reasons. Can cause an optic So they're the compressive causes. Just if you're going to remember anything, remember meningioma and pituitary adenoma. They're fairly common. Infiltrative causes, these tend to be subacute, weeks to months. Lymphoma and leukemia would be the two more um, common ones. They can infiltrate the optic nerve, the brain, the retina, um, multiple myeloma, not rare. So be aware of those. And then toxic and nutritional, I mentioned right up front, tends to happen, lower socioeconomic situations, alcoholism, not uncommon, and the homeless population are at risk of this sort of thing. There are medications that can cause optic neuropathies as well, less common these days, but methotrexate is fairly common. It's taken at a high, a high dose for long enough. Phanabitol tends to be less common these days. Amiodarone probably still reasonably common out there. Ethanol or methanol of, you know, excess can cause uh, optic neuropathy. And um, methanol you can get in bootleg alcohol. So if you make your own alcohol at home, just beware, right? Or if you go to Asia and drink overseas, be careful, because people go over there and lose vision. Binge drinking, there's a higher methanol content. You just need to be aware of that. Try and drink out of, um, you know, not homemade spirits, something that's coming out of a, a genuine bottle. Okay, so to summarize, guys, these are the main four conditions that I want you to know about, or we expect you to know about for your exams. So, inflammatory and demyelinating, you can more or less put together in the younger age bracket. Optic neuritis, either inflammatory or demyelinating, both are autoimmune mediated. Then you've got arteritic ischemic, which is GCA in your older age group, and NAION in your middle-aged group. That's the basic approach, and then the management should follow from there. This, this is the most, uh, the, the colored bit, the age, that's the bit that you really want to take away. All right, that should help your problem solving. And hopefully we've covered these things. Uh, just for your interest, this is what an enlarged blind spot looks like, okay? So a normal blind spot, when you do a visual field test, you should all be able to map your own blind spots with your finger or a pen. Um, if not, we can talk about that afterwards. So, and the normal blind spot should be about the size of a 50 cent piece. And so if anything significantly bigger than that, there's an enlarged blind spot. Blind spots are there because of the presence of the optic nerve, because of the physical presence. Of the, there's no retinal tissue there. That's why it's a blind spot. And so optic neuropathies will often start off as an enlarged blind spot, which then becomes a, a bigger scotoma at the time. All right, that's the end of today's talk, guys. Welcome to ask any questions.